It's so good to be here. No, I'm not Kevin. I know I look a lot like him, but uh, he's out hunting on vacation. So I don't know if he's hunting for a vacation or he's hunting. He's, he's somewhere in the northwest Oklahoma. So um, I'll be glad when he's back this next week. And I know you will be too, but I appreciate the opportunity to stand before you. I want to take this moment to celebrate. Uh, we have a couple in here that's celebrating their anniversary today. And are the Unruhs here? They moved on me. Oh, they're the, oh half of them are here. So uh, They shared with me today's their 57th wedding anniversary. So I wanted to tell them congratulations. I thanked Miss Jan for putting up with Brother Ron for 57 years. And so it's, it's good that we can celebrate together on occasions like this. So today, I, I know Kevin's been going through a series of the church. Um, the, today's lesson is going to be related to the church, but it's going to be kind of like parallel to his, his lessons. We're going to take it from the, uh, the prophet Haggai. If you want to turn there to the prophet Haggai. Haggai is one of the prophets following the Babylonian captivity. He has uh, been assigned by God to speak to the children of Israel because the children, have, uh, the children of Israel have been released from Babylon and are now in their homeland. And so they are forgetting the most important thing that they've been assigned to do. And let's read beginning in verse 2, and we'll read through verse 9. Thus says the Lord of hosts, This people says, The time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of, of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much, but harvest little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there is not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house, which lies desolate, while each of you runs into his own house. So the first question God has asked them, where is my house? And the people of Israel coming back from 70 years of captivity, I can understand what they're thinking. They're coming back and thinking, I need to get my house in order. I need to take care of my family. I need to make sure that we are secure, that we are doing what we're doing to take care of the family. So they've been busy living their lives, but not even recognizing what has taken place in their lives. And so God is saying, where is my house? The people have finally come out and said, you know, right now is not a good time for us to rebuild the temple. And so God comes to Haggai and says, you need to speak to the children of Israel. They need to focus on what's going on in their life. They need to stop and ask themselves, what's number one in my life? And so God is asking them, is it really a time for you yourselves because they have been living all along about taking care of their own needs. They've been looking to the physical, but they never look to the spiritual. And so God is wanting them to look spiritually. He's wanting them to take a deep, soul-searching evaluation and asking themselves, where is God when it comes to my priorities? Because God has says, you make me number one, and I will be glorified. I will be honored. But then he comes along and asks them, look at what's taking place in your life. Look at your crops. You've, you've sown much, but you have brought very little to harvest. 
You take food to your tables, but look what's taking place. There's much eating, but you're not being satisfied. You're, there's people drinking, but no one's getting filled. And then he says, take a look at your, just your daily living. You're putting on clothes, but no one gets warm. And God says, look to your finances. You earn wages to bring them home and put them in purses that have holes. So not only just their daily living, but their whole economics has gone into poverty. And they're, they're just focused on their prosperity, but God's saying, what about my prosperity? So he says, consider your ways. Think about it. Look at your life. He says, then go to the mountains, get the timber, and bring it back and build my house. He says, I will then look on it with favor and will be glorified. Now, let's take this for just a moment and look at our own lives today. We don't have a physical temple that needs to be built, but we do have a temple that we are, that belongs to God. Are we, as his children, focused on building his temple? Because did not Peter say that we are the living stones did not Paul say that we are the body of Christ? And in that body is where God dwells. Remember when God was in the wilderness with the children of Israel, he told Moses to tell the children of Israel, build a tabernacle so that I may dwell in their midst. And Paul says that God says, you will be my children and I will live and walk among you. But are we truly making God number one? Are we truly looking to his temple? Are we truly looking at our own lives and evaluating our own hearts and our own souls? Are we focused on our own prosperity? Or are we looking to God and making him number one? And so when it comes to this... The people of Israel would gather the materials necessary to rebuild the temple. But for uncertain reasons, those items laid there without being used or even as purposed. Matter of fact, they were probably taking some of that material and rebuilding their own homes. Because God says, you are going to your paneled houses. You're taking what belongs to me and putting it to your use. And so, he says, you've been expecting much, but getting little. And he says, what you brought home, I blew it away. The imagery here suggests that the human achievements are so fragile and temporal that a mere breath from God can destroy them. Think about Jesus' lesson there on the Sermon of the Mount. Towards the end of Matthew chapter 7, he says... Those who hear my words and obey are like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rains will come and the floods will come, but the house will still stand. But those who hear my words and do not obey are like the man who built his house upon the sand. The rains come and the floods come and the house is washed away. The storms of life will determine how firm we stand or how easy we are blown over. Because if we are truly focused on God's temple, God's holy word, then we will be able to stand firm. Psalms 119 verses 4 through 6 states, You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees, then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. So, wonder what would keep people from being steadfast in obeying God's word. The people here in Haggai had become blind to God's chastening hand. He says, listen, God who controls the rain and the harvest is withholding his blessings until he is placed in your life as number one priority. Jesus tells us 
and Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Because Jesus was telling them about how the people would go about their lives and they would be focused on what they should wear or what they should eat. And, and Jesus is saying, listen, you have a God in heaven that knows exactly what you need. But if you focus on his kingdom and his righteousness, all those things that you worry about will fall into place and God will take care of you. So let's not become the people Jesus spoke with. He says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. So for it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. So the first thing that we need to think about when it comes to, to building God's temple, as well as Haggai telling the people of Israel, there must be a deliberate action of putting God first. That will require focus and continual effort. Because spiritual prosperity requires that focus, requires that continual effort. Material prosperity is often an easy fallback on when we think life is not going our way. If I only have this much more money, all my worries can go away. Or if I had this big house, all the problems would be taken care of. But God says, all that that you bring for yourselves without seeking me, I will blow it away. Spiritual living is a constant fight to stay in it. That's why Jesus said to the, to the people standing around there, he says, strive to enter through the narrow door. I want you to focus on that word strive because in, in the original language when Jesus was using this, it is often associated as an athletic term. So I want you, us to imagine an athlete who is training for his or her particular event. And in that training process, there are moments in time that that athlete is probably thinking, I don't want to get up and do this. I'm too tired. I'm not strong enough. Or I'll wait till next year and I'll be better. Those are the kind of thoughts every athlete has to fight through. And so that athlete will fight through, will strive to get beyond that obstacle and even a long distance runner will come to a point that he, think, he or she thinks, I can't go any further. But it's interesting that that runner, once he, once he or she hits that wall but breaks through, they have a second wind and they can keep on moving to the goal of that finish line or whatever, wherever that is. There's never been an athlete who has trained to lose their event that they've been training for. So we as children of God must strive in such a way that we have to break through those obstacles that come in life that keeps us from striving to be closer to God. Well, maybe those moments come when we look at the Bible and go, I'll read that tomorrow. I don't have time today. Oh, I've got to turn, there's this movie I need to watch, or there's a game I need to watch, or there's something, I'll just, I'll take care of God's word at a later time. Or maybe it's coming to the time of being together here. We, we wake up on a Sunday morning and we're going, I really don't want to be there. My wife says, Gene, you're a minister, you have to get up anyways. But we have those moments in time to where we need to fight through and strive to make God number one. Because there's not one material prosperity that will make us any better and fill that need. Only God can. So, let's make that focus. Let's put forth that effort to recognize the voice of God. Because Jesus says, when he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. 
We live in a day and time that there are so many different voices that are calling for our attention, that are calling for our association with them. But God says, know my voice. And we'll follow him. You see, Haggai preached the word to the people and he began teaching, preaching to the leaders. Now, when the people heard the word of the Lord, they listened. It would have been easy for them to disregard Haggai or disregard that God has spoken. This took place in Jeremiah. Jeremiah, towards the end of his prophecy, was describing the captivity to Babylon. There were some people, refugees, left in the land of Israel, and they came to Jeremiah and said, Jeremiah, pray unto God so we may know what God wants for us, and we will do what he says. So Jeremiah goes off and prays. It was ten days later when God answered Jeremiah and told Jeremiah, tell the people to stay in this land. Do not go to Egypt. Or they'll die. So Jeremiah comes back to that group of refugees and tells them, I have a message. And he tells the people, do not go to Egypt or you will die. Stay in this land. Just a 10-day period, the people had already changed their tune and says, no, we will not listen. We will go to Egypt. We have to stay connected to God. We have to focus. We have that continual effort. So putting God's house above our own prosperity requires self-evaluation in the fear of God. And this fear is that respect, knowing who God is, knowing the power God has, knowing that God has the word of life. And so twice God told the people, consider your ways. Stop what you are doing and evaluate your life in regards to God's word. So let me ask you, what takes up most of your time? Where and when does God reign? Because when the people of Israel heard the word of God from Haggai, they listened. There was this fear of God. There's this reverence for God. Look at verse 12 there, uh, verse 1. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people showed reverence for the Lord. You see, that reverence, that fearing of God is not just an Old Testament concept. It's a New Testament concept as well. It's teaching, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. There's a respect. Yeah, we might fear those in this physical world that could kill us and remove our physical body from this earth, but there's a God more powerful that has the ability not only to remove us physically, but to remove us spiritually from his presence. Paul says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting, bringing it to a completion, making it whole because of our reverence to an almighty God. And he also said in Ephesians, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. If we truly respect God and we truly respect Jesus, then we will look to one another and understand that you are more important than I. And I will put my needs after yours. So imagine the result when we reverently obey God by putting his house above our own material prosperity. Imagine what this church could be. Imagine what this church could do when we put God first. 
when we come together and we have this opportunity to bring an offering before God and we give God our best and not the rest, imagine what could take place. So when God is first, understand that he is pleased and glorified. Isaiah writes, everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. You see, God created us for his glory, not for ours, to come to him, not to come to one another, but come to him first. And Jesus also said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So when God is first, he's not only just pleased and glorified, but the work gets done. So when God stirs the, stirs the hearts of the people, the work, look at verse 14 of, of Haggai chapter 1. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. When we have our priorities in order, it's because God has moved in our hearts. Remember, God wants our best, not our leftovers. And then God... Is, Work gets done, but he truly blesses. When the people of Israel listened and got to work on the temple, God told them, I am with you. Paul tells us in Romans 8, verse 31, if God is for us, who's against us? So the true blessing comes when we have truly put God in first place. We will experience a new awareness of his presence. So here's a question for you today. Where is your heart? Is God number one in everything and every place and every word? Or are you looking to your own needs in other places than God? Because God's asking us to build this temple. Jesus tells us in John 15 that he is the vine and we are the branches. As long as we abide in him and he abides in us, we will bear much fruit. But if we don't abide in him, we can do nothing. There will be no fruit. And if there's no fruit, there's no temple. But I'm telling you that God is already working. He's building his temple. The only question is, are we going to join with him and bear that fruit to make that temple of his stand on the hill or a light on a lampstand so that others can know the hope and the love Jesus has given us? That's the lesson for you today. If there's anything we can do for anyone, come while we stand and sing.